Um, hey everyone, my name is Sunny Lim. I am a senior and a journalism major and for the summer experience Dr. Norse who works in the anthropology department was my faculty mentor. Um, and just a little bit of history about Laura's House. It primarily started in 1994 as a domestic violence shelter in Orange County, California. And um, prior to this, I had um, interned with other local nonprofits dealing with um, disabilities and also homelessness. And this time I decided to work with them because they were around 35 minutes from my home city. And Laura's House um, is actually named after the girl in the picture on the right. Um, Laura was actually 38 when she was murdered by her husband, and the committee who founded the shelter originally um, decided to name the shelter after her, um, after her mother reached out to them and said, you know, I wish that this type of resource was available when she was going through this, and you know, I'm thankful that you're starting something like this in the community. And um, my job really in the shelter was really um, just anywhere when they needed me. Um, so I just had a lot of hats on. Um, I worked in the daycare, which is also pictured on the left. Um, I had to watch a lot of kids who were in the daycare because their mothers were either getting therapy sessions or some sort of other type of job training. And on the right, it's just like a picture of um, how like the room is pretty much set up. There were 12, around 12 rooms in the actual shelter, and then each of them had two sets of bunk beds as well, and then also two cribs, and then also like a suite style of bathroom. And um, in addition to helping with childcare, I also participated in the intake system when new clients come in, just taking like a general history of, you know, what um, conditions they might have, and then what types of abuse that they endured, or um, any type of other medical history that we had to know about. And then, um, yeah, in addition to that, I just really had to run around to each room um, just to see like what the mothers really needed. Um, oftentimes they were coming just like right away from their houses in emergency situations. So a lot of them would ask me to, you know, like I need certain supplies because I didn't have time to pack when I left. So uh, yeah, so overall it was just juggling many type of um, responsibilities, but those were really the three main um, tasks that I was given. And then for the prompt which asked about um, you know, comparing theories and practices, I um, went into this knowing, like mostly just hearing stereotypes about domestic violence, you know, the common theme about like why didn't they just leave. And I, you know, I didn't really know the complexity of like why some people might stay in those type of situations. And um, Dr. Norse provided me a lot of comprehensive readings and all of them um, provided the original two theories, which are mentioned here. Um, a lot of the academics in those readings talked about the two initial theories about domestic violence, which was um, loss of control and then learned helplessness. And those two theories were, um, were criticized a lot because um, the loss of control theory basically was saying that men, and both also women, just did not have the capability to control their rage and emotions and that was why they were taking it out on their spouses. And alcohol was another theme that was mentioned because some of them were addicted to alcohol. Alcohol just in, like just increased their rage and that was another source of why they couldn't control their anger. And learned helplessness theory was saying that both women and men in these type of situations just stay because all of the abuses that they've endured, they've just gotten used to it and they've just lost um, all will and motivation to really leave. And and all of those readings really criticize those theories saying that, you know, after decades of research really, um, you know, these two theories are basically just trash. Um, they um, shifted the blame more toward the actual victims and they didn't actually get at the core of why um, like what type of reasons that they're actually like staying for. And then I saw that in the shelter as well because a lot of the women that I've talked to, um, there, there were around nine women in the shelter at the time of my work and then there was also one male victim as well. Um, all of them were saying things that like, I don't, have, I don't have the money, like I don't know where to go for a shelter and you know, it's better being beaten at home than being on the streets with my children. Um, other people have said that you know they're d undocumented and my spouse is threat threatening to report me 
and you know just stuff like that that's not it's not really obvious on the surface and but when you actually um, you know just talk to these people and try to examine like where like what type of angles that they're coming from and why they might be staying it's not actually as um, easy as it seems and then that also connects with the learned helplessness theory um, not all of them were staying because they didn't want to leave um, a lot of them didn't have the resources they didn't know where to go um, they didn't have the money they were scared that um, their spouses might um, actually petition for child custody in the court system as well and then um, I also noticed that the academic readings actually didn't mention criticisms about VALA, which is the Violence Against Women Act, which was drafted in the Clinton administration, and it was basically really the first comprehensive like, le like legislation that actually addressed um, domestic violence in the United States and really provided around $1.6 billion in funding because before that, um, the battered women's movement didn't actually take um, start until around the 1970s in the States. And before then, even though there were shelters, they were mostly funded by personal funds. And VAWA really um, provided the actual national funding. But in recent years, a lot of people, um, well, legal advocates as well, have been criticizing VAWA, saying that you know, where where is the accountability for these funding? Like, are we actually seeing um, rates of domestic violence go down because of the funding? Are we um, are we defining domestic violence too broad? Because one criticism about VAWA was that it was too vague in the types of actions that they considered abuse because there is a clause from anywhere between stalking, harassment, physical beatings to a verbal spat. And then you know, legal advocates were asking, well, what does a verbal spat mean? Because it could be just like a couple just arguing, but, you know, it's it was really just a criticism of, you know, what are the parameters of this issue? Like, how can we define this further? And how can we also identify the type of programs in domestic violence agencies that are actually being the most effective in order to funnel, uh, funnel funding through those instead of maybe just like, giving funds to programs that might not be as effective and it's actually um, not doing well for spending. And yeah, I mean, um, after my experiences working there, I, I think there are a couple of solutions that I thought could be you know, possibly effective in the future if they were enacted. And one of them was just doing an overhaul of VAWA um, since it has drawn so much controversy and it doesn't actually um, address some of these issues, you know, funding for shelters that have LGBTQ clients or like male clients, um, just doing an overhaul on VAWA, um, drafting it again with other legal advocates and people in the community um, to really sit down and just identify like which areas are the most effective for solving domestic violence and then um, shifting the funds to there and then cutting back costs on that because that's also another criticism about VAWA too from both um, both sides of the political spectrum is that, you know, where is this funding going and how is this actually being affected? And then for the shelter agency system, I personally think that a lot of the, um, the system is actually a little bit more passive than I would wish. Um, I think we wait too long in order for women and men to come to us when they're, they realize that their life is in danger. And I think we should be taking a more proactive approach, um, you know, go through databases of domestic violence um, reports in each state and see, you know, which house has been having, like, maybe, like, multiple reports in a short span of time, and if it's, like, really just getting more dangerous, um, going to that house and just, you know, checking on on them and then just asking if they need assistance, like, right away, because um, I think it would be a better idea to meet them halfway instead of waiting for them to make all the journey to the system itself. Thank you.